Wesley wrote that hymn in around 1760. Still holds up, doesn't it? You know why? The Word of God doesn't change. The Word of God doesn't change. Turn to Ephesians uh, chapter 4 as we continue studying. Uh, we'll begin at verse 25 this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, having put away uh, falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Why do we do that? For we are members of one another. Uh, when he's using the word neighbor, he's not talking about your next door neighbor in Benton. Uh, and you know that because it says we. He's talking to the church at Ephesus, the household of faith. Let each one of you speak with his neighbor for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. By the way, it doesn't say don't let the sun go down on your dispute. I've done marriage counseling and they're up at four o'clock in the morning still hammering it out. And they say, Pastor, well, doesn't the Bible say don't let the sun go down on your anger? I said, right. Confess your anger at like 10 o'clock and fix the dispute tomorrow. <laughs> Nothing improves at 4 a.m. It just doesn't. <laughs> So you don't give uh, anger an emotional priority. Repent of that before the Lord with each other. And then go to sleep and fix it tomorrow. You'll be okay. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And here's the reason. Give no opportunity for the devil. That's the problem. You give the devil a place to stand in your life uh, with this sort of behavior. Uh, let the thief no longer steal. Does it surprise you that Paul writing to the church at Ephesus is warning people in the church at Ephesus not to be stealing stuff? Right? He's writing to Christians. Not those people out there. He's writing to Christians. Let the thief no longer steal. But how do you fix that? Rather, let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. And why should he do that? Uh, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Uh, the cure uh, for being a thief is hard work coupled with generosity. And uh, then you start to value what other people have. Uh, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. This is an interesting word. It actually is a word used uh, for putrid fish. Uh, it, you know, it's talk and it's speech that stinks. Some of you have been on the other end of that, haven't you, I'm afraid. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, so you have to be wise, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Uh, when Brenda and I got married, a friend of ours, you know, was a, a, a banker. And at that time, you know, I was a young buck stockbroker, and he decided a really good present to give me was bookends. I had these favorite books on investments uh, that I would read, and uh, he thought that those uh, bookends would look good on my desk, uh, and that it was bull and, you know what a bull and a bear is? Yeah, bull's the good one, bear's what you're experiencing now. <laughs> bull and bear. And so between those bull and bear uh, bookends were my uh, favorite go-to books uh, on investments. Everything between those bookends was about investments because the bookends uh, symbolized uh, the investment community. Now the same thing is true of your Bible. There's bookends in your Bible. The Bible begins and ends in the exact same place. And that means that everything in between the beginning and end of your scripture is about one thing and one thing only. It's one story. And it begins this way in the Garden of Eden. And the Lord walked and talked with Adam and Eve. He was 
present with them in the Garden of Eden. And where does the Bible end? In Revelation 21. And out of heaven will come down the new Jerusalem, and God will dwell with man and be present with them forever and ever. The whole problem of Scripture is solving the one thing that sin did to you. It separated you from the presence of God. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they were ejected from God's presence. And so God said, I'm going to have to bring you back to my presence. So slowly but surely, he reintroduces the sinners now to his presence. A little bit here and a little bit there. Meet me at the altar and I will be present with you there. Uh, meet me at the tabernacle of my presence uh, that is constructed in the wilderness. And now will you build for me a temple, a house where I can dwell? Go ahead and build it. I will meet you there uh, in the Holy of Holies. And then finally, uh, he comes and meets us in person, in the person of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. He is present with us. And that is the down payment of the new Jerusalem, the new city of God, that new heavens and the new earth. The entire Bible is about the loss of the presence of God and the return to his presence through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the consummation of the promise to the return to the presence uh, in the new heavens and the new earth. And that is precisely, uh, if you you've been reading Ephesians, what Paul understands about his Bible. Because from the beginning, that's how he has tried to describe what motivates everything uh, that we do in the Christian life. How did he start chapter 1, uh, verse 3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in the heavenly places. And then uh, chapter 1, verse 10, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and uh, things on earth. And then again in verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Are you picking up a theme? Uh, the theme is that what God does for you in salvation is return you to the presence of God. He rescues you from the wrath to come and returns you to his presence. And so now Paul, in one of the most famous uh, summary statements, uh, describes what it means to be saved. And if I say to the average person on the street, well, what does it mean to be saved? Oh, I just feel better. You know, I just, I really do. I feel great, and uh, the Lord really helped me, and I'm saved now. Saved from what? Well, uh, you know, I, I'm saved. Saved from what? When you get saved, you know, I, I used to be a lifeguard. <laughs> and I rescued a few people. Life-saving. So, it means to be rescued. Well, what are you rescued from? You're rescued from alienation with God. You are rescued from the fact that his presence isn't in your life. You are rescued, rescued from your own alienation and isolation as a human being. That's the problem that you're trying to live with, which is why you make up identities, which is why you just, you know, jump from one fad to another, because you don't know who you are, because God is not present with you. All you have is yourself, and you're present with yourself. So what happens in salvation is what Paul describes in uh, chapter 2, in a statement that you all know, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And the verse that no one quotes, and uh, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. If I say to you, do you feel like you've been seated in the heavenly places? It's like, Pastor, that is not where I've been sitting lately. <laughs> uh, my life does not look like I'm seated in the heavenly places at all. I'm wondering uh, if there is a heavenly place for me ever. 
But the description of salvation is that Christ redeems you and in that act of salvation seats you with him in his presence in the heavenly places. Heaven is where the presence of God is. And he seats you in the heavenly places. And of course that's not enough because then in chapter 3 verse 10 he says what? So that through the church... Well, how am I going to experience his presence? Where two or three are gathered together, there I am in his midst. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities. Where? In the heavenly places. You see what the issue is? The issue is uh, that we, as the church of Jesus Christ, are an embassy, an outpost for heaven. That's what the point is. Uh, and when you uh, walk up to an embassy, uh, in no matter what country you're in, and you show an American passport, the minute you step foot on that ground, you are under the jurisdiction of the United States. And when you step into the jurisdiction of Jesus Christ, you are stepping into the culture of heaven, the church of Jesus Christ. And that's what we don't understand, and it's why I make you pray it every Sunday morning. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the point that Paul is making here is that everything that we say and do is a result of being members one of another in the body of Christ, which is the culture of heaven, because we are all seated in the heavenly places together within the presence of God himself. He is with you through his spirit indwelling you. And he has promised uh, to be uh, with us. And that's the issue. If I say to you, what is Christianity all about? People say, well, Christianity is about going to heaven. No, it isn't. You don't go to heaven. I mean, some of you. <laughs> Heaven comes to you. Read your Bible. All these guys that read Revelation, they say, I read it literally. No, you don't. You don't read it literally enough. That's your problem. Heaven comes down. And God dwells with us in the new heavens and the new earth here. And your job as a Christian is to begin to build the culture of heaven now. It is a down payment. It's the first fruits of the harvest. It will be consummated in the new heavens and the new earth, but we already now live in the heavenly places with Christ, even though it is not yet fully consummated. There's more to come. You have it now, but it's not everything you're going to get. But what we're supposed to do now is be transformed by a culture that has nothing to do with the culture of this world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, and so we are now seated in the heavenlies with Christ. Your primary description, your primary GPS locator in your spiritual life is that you are seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus now. And that is supposed to change some things about you. Uh, that means that you're going to be transformed and you're going to be shaped by a heavenly culture. And that transformation in this passage is going to uh, arrive in two or three different ways. First of all, he's going to say that you are going to be transformed in your speech. The language of heaven is different. Uh, then he's going to say you're going to be transformed in your relationships. The culture of heaven is different. Uh, and then he's going to say you're going to be transformed uh, in your experience of God himself. Because now what it means to be saved by grace through faith and that not of yourself, that it is the gift of God, is that you are now seated with this redeeming, saving, loving, merciful, gracious God. You're seated with him. You have been returned to his presence and you are now experiencing heaven now. And our job is to be full of the Spirit of God so that our spiritual lives begin to reflect the culture that we have been uh, born into as members of the Church of Jesus Christ. So far, so good? 
Yeah, we'll see. All right, first of all, it says you transform your speech. Look at uh, 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 the language of heaven versus uh, the language uh, of uh, the world. You see, he says, don't let corrupting talk come out of your mouth, uh, but only such as is good for building us up. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit with this bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. Don't steal. Uh, don't be angry. Uh, put away falsehood. Speak truth. Do you see all of these uh, uh, monikers? They're all talking about your speech and what we ought to have uh, if we are now experiencing the culture of heaven is we ought to have a gag reflex for this kind of speech, the speech of falsehood, the speech of corrupting talk, uh, this, the speech of slander in uh, verse uh, 31. You know what the gag reflex is? You guys all watched Happy Days, didn't you? You did. You watched it. So I want you this morning to be a little more like Fonzie. Do you, do you remember when Fonzie, uh, you know, he would, he would start to gag uh, when he had to say the word wrong? I, I was... I was... He couldn't get it out. He couldn't get it out. He had a gag reflex. He couldn't say the word wrong. Well, as members of heaven... Uh, we ought to have a gag reflex to slander. We ought to have a gag reflex to falsehood. We ought to have a gag reflex to corrupting talk. We ought to have a hard time getting that out of our mouths. You know, I, I, it's funny. Uh, many of you will be happy to know that we had the sound technicians in this week uh, because we're putting a new sound system in so you can actually hear everything. And some of you will be very happy with that. Uh, but, you know, the sound technician came in, he looked like all sound guys, you know, the long gray ponytail and the beard and all that. But he knew what he was doing. I was really pleased to have him. Uh, but he, w he looked at our, and I'll call it a soundboard because it's not a soundboard. This thing is 1950s technology. I don't even know what to call it. But he looked at it and then he cussed. <laughs> and I'm standing there, he goes, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, well, you know, that's what it's like to be in the present. I'm not Jesus, but you know what I'm saying. You're in the presence of Jesus. You're seated with him in the heavenlies. Watch your mouth. Would you speak if Jesus was sitting at the cross a table like that, the way you talk about people? Come on. You're seated with him in the heavenlies. Uh, you are present with God. He is with you at all times. You're running your mouth like Jesus isn't in the room. Can't do it. Corrupting talk. That's not the language of heaven. Falsehood, that's not the language of heaven. But what is the language of heaven? Look what he says in uh, verse 29. This is the language of heaven. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only, only the kind of talk that does what? That is good for building up as fits the occasion. So you have to be wise that it may do something, give grace to those who hear. Ah, oh, that's the language of heaven. Do you understand that you have no Christian obligation for criticism? None. Your obligation as a Christian is the obligation of encouraging speech that builds up other people and delivers grace to them. That's the only obligation you have. That's the language of heaven. That's how we're supposed to talk to one another. You know, I, these Christians, and they're always these snooty Christians. You've seen them, right? They, they want to forgive themselves for their speech. And so they'll just say, well, I'm just a fruit inspector. Have you heard that phrase? It's like, yeah, you might be a fruit, but you're not a fruit inspector. There's one fruit inspector. You know who that is? That's Christ. You deliver grace. You take it easy on people. Uh, you deliver something that will build them up and encourage them. There's no obligation to do anything in the body of Christ except build one another up, encourage one another, deliver grace to other sinners just like you. That is the language of heaven. And when you realize that every moment of your life, every breath you take, every thought you think, 
everything you do, you actually do in the presence of Jesus Christ because he indwells you through his spirit and you are now, right now, seated in the heavenlies with him. Are you sure that you want to have Christ hear you talking like that about other people? Is that what you want? It's not what I want. Don't get me wrong, I do it, but I, it's bad. So see, being seated in the heavenlies transforms your speech. But not only that, it transforms your relationships. Because you just see what he says? The whole rationale, therefore, having put away falsehood in verse 25, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbors. And then you get the big why. Well, why, why do we want to do that? Why do I want to speak the truth to my, to my fellow Christians? Because, for, we are members of one another. In other words, what happens is that when you are united to Jesus Christ, you are also united to everybody else who's united to Jesus Christ. And it's not just some sort of minor attachment. You are literally members of one another. People say church membership uh, isn't biblical. I found the word right here. You are members of one another. You are to publicly declare that I'm with that person there, and I'm with that person there, and I'm going to love them, I'm going to care for them, I'm going to walk with them in faith until Christ comes. That's what we're called to do. We are members of one another. And so heaven is not some sort of individually owned and operated franchise. Heaven is a community. It's the culture of heaven. We are all seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And we forget this. We read this passage as if, you know, by grace you're saved through faith and not out of yourself we're seated in the heavens. He's writing to an entire church. He's not writing to Bob, Dick, and Harry by themselves. He's writing to the whole church. And all those yous in that passage are plural. You all are seated in the heavenlies and you are members of one another so we are a community of faith and because we are members of one another because we're united to one another because we have an obligation to one another that means that heaven has a value system there's a way to operate because Christ has done this for us we now respond in love to him in a way that values what Christ values if Christ's work results in seeding you in the heavenly places, then Christ's continued work in you as you are kept by the power of God through his indwelling spirit is to begin to shape and conform you to the image of his son who is in community as our elder brother, Jesus Christ, as Hebrews puts it. We are in the family of God together. So heaven has a value system. And I'll summarize the culture this way. The value system of heaven is a culture of blessing. We're here to bless one another. Uh, we're here to love one another. We're here to care for one another. We're here to bear each other's burdens. We're here to pray for one another. And you can't do that in the abstract. You know, I say, well, we're going to have some community fellowships. We're going to do a four-week experiment of this passage right here. And people look at me like, yeah, but what are we going to have to do? And, you know, it's like a star chamber. There's no secret handshakes. There's nothing like that. All you do is you go to someone's house and you learn who they are and you have a bite to eat together. And then maybe in discussion, you'll find someone else to bless. Mysterious, isn't it? Oh. You can't be a member of Christ's church in the abstract. You can't congratulate yourself for being a member of the body of Christ and not know anybody. It's not just you and Jesus. It's all of us together. And we have an obligation to know who each other is so we can pray for each other, love each other, support each other, bear one another's burdens. That's what we're called to do. That is the heavenly culture. And that heavenly culture is defined in verse 32 in a certain way. What does it say? Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving uh, one another as God in Christ forgave you. Hey, that's your community fellowship. You get together once a week and you're kind to one another. And you're easy on each other. You're tender-hearted. You're not taking anybody to task. And you're forgiving 
Why are you a forgiving person? Because you have been forgiven. What kind of a hypocrite do you want to be? Christ forgives you and then you start being hard on everybody else? Stop that. No, there's no room for that in the body of Christ. We're all forgiven. Uh, we are all in such deep need of the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. Uh, we hadn't ought to have time to criticize people. Our only job is to be thankful. We should be so busy worshiping Christ for his mercy and his love and his grace and his forgiveness to us that you don't have time to do anything but bless other people. That's what we're called to do. That's the value system. That's the culture of heaven. Kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Not being callous and hard. And forgiving one another. That's what we're called to do. But, what's the culture of the earth look like? Well, it looks like anger. It looks like thieves. It looks like corrupting talk. Uh, it looks like bitterness. It looks like wrath and clamor. You know what clamor is? It's a kerfuffle. You know those people, right? It doesn't matter what happens in their life. They're always in some sort of snit about something. <laughs> Honest to goodness. So let me tell you what the Greek says here, right? I'll just put it, you know, I don't want to pull rank on you and you're good. Here's what the Greek says. Lighten up. <laughs> you are a forgiven person. Now you have received the mercy of God. Uh, you have, God has been easy on you. He has not treated you as your sins deserved. He treated Christ as your sins deserved. And because that's true, you now want to deliver the grace of Christ to other people in the same way that he delivered grace to you. What is your job? Your job in the church of Jesus Christ is to become a delivery system for his grace and his mercy. It ought to be just spilling all over the place here. This place ought to be drowning in grace. Drowning in mercy. That's the culture of heaven. It transforms your speech. How you talk to one another. And being seated with Christ in the heavenlies transforms your relationships. But finally, it transforms your view of God. You know, because we all tend to see God in kind of a weird way. I'll be honest with you. I mean... People describe God and it's not the God of the Bible. I don't know who it is, but it's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is the God who showed up in Jesus Christ and forgave you of your sins. The God of the Bible is the one who's loved you from all eternity. The God of the Bible is the God who has graciously given himself while you were still dead in your trespasses and sins. That's the God of the Bible. It's not, you know, the Star Wars God. May the force be with you. Do you see what it says here? And this makes some people uncomfortable, but I just love doing that. <laughs> Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now you can't grieve an impersonal force. He is a person. Co-equal with the Father, the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he indwells your life. And when you talk the way you sometimes talk. And when you think the way you sometimes think. Uh, and when you approach people the way that you sometimes approach people. The Holy Spirit of God is virtually grieved. Grieved. If you've been a parent. You know what grief feels like. When your children do something that is so dishonoring. And so destructive. That you don't know how you can wrap your head around it. If you're, if you're a parent, you've been there. But did we throw them out? No, we just wept. We just grieved. But we didn't separate our children from us, did we? And that's exactly what happens in this passage. He is a personal God. But... Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, does not threaten you with the loss of the relationship. He just reminds you that the Holy Spirit is a personal God and that he is grieved by our sin. And how does he handle that grief? He handles that grief by forgiving us. He is a gracious God. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. 
the whole point of being a Christian is to understand that you are a forgiven person and you serve the gracious, merciful, loving God of the universe who has from all eternity determined to set his love on you and his grace on you and to forgive you from all of your sins. Now go and do likewise and start in your home. Don't talk about being a Christian outside of your home. How do you speak to your spouse? How do you speak to your children? How do you speak at work? Does anybody know you're a Christian? Is your speech kind and tender-hearted? Well, that's the way that Jesus spoke to you. Come all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I, the God of the universe, will give you rest. So I pray this morning that you realize that when you were saved by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, you were brought from your, the residence of your old man into a new residence. You have been seated in the heavenly places. You are there now. And it is our job now in response of love to that God who has graciously saved us to begin to live in heaven now. And that will transform the way you talk. Your language will become heavenly, kind-hearted and tender. Your relationships will be transformed. They will become heavenly. You'll stop being so hard on other people. You realize that everybody needs grace just like you needed it. And you're going to start delivering grace to other people. And you will change the way you look at your creator. He is not a merciless, impersonal force. He is the gracious, loving, heavenly father who does all things well. And he will never leave you or forsake you. Thanks be to God that we have been translated to the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. Let's pray together.